R-A-A-C, Reinforced Autoclaved Aerated Concrete. <laughs> this feels a bit like an essay where I don't know where to start. So I've just put the title of what I'm going to talk about at the top of the page with the hope that it will provide some inspiration and or direction. I, I think it's working. So recently in the UK, there has been a mass closure of schools with students having to be taught in temporary classrooms or even go back to Zoom like in the glory days of COVID as a result of inadequate school structures. This issue came to light over the recent summer where instances of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, I'm, I'm gonna get those two A's mixed up throughout this video by the way, just so you're prepared. Instances of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete planks installed as roofs to schools, suddenly collapsing into classrooms below. Now, fortunately it was the summer break, so no one was hurt, but the potential for further instances where someone might be less lucky is obvious. As a result, there has been a mass closure of schools. At current count, that number is apparently over 100. And it isn't just schools either, with hospitals and military buildings also coming under scrutiny. I am a structural engineer, and I have played a pretty big part, to be specific for the theme of this video, in the design of two reinforced concrete secondary schools in the UK. This was some time ago, mind, just before the credit crunch, I mean, to be honest, that particular financial disaster probably played a part in what we are seeing today. And we'll talk about that later. But what I'm trying to get at is that basically, I have a lot to say on the subject. So, what is reinforced aerated autoclaved concrete? See, I told you I'd get the A's mixed up. Now, this is probably an overused analogy, but RAAC is like the aero equivalent of concrete where a traditional concrete slab will be more like a solid block of chocolate. The concrete of RAAC is filled with air pockets. This makes it lighter and gives it much better thermal properties, but it compromises the structural strength. It is weaker than traditional concrete by a factor of about two. Autoclaved aerated concrete has a compressive strength about half that of normal concrete. I'm going by the standards here. These are the numbers we use to design structures what the material can actually achieve in a test environment might be different. This is also modern concrete. The RAAC planks we are talking about, the ones causing all the problems, are from the 70s and 80s, and their grade and composition might be completely different to the modern equivalent. But RAAC is lighter, and this helps. The burden of reinforced concrete structures is in their self-weight. The weight of the concrete itself in any concrete structure probably comprises 75% of all the loads the structure is going to experience. 75% of the structural drop that reinforced concrete does is just in supporting itself. So if we can use a lighter version of concrete, then it needs to carry less load and we can therefore use a material that is weaker. That is the theory. The problem is that there are reasons good ones, why we don't specify these kinds of planks anymore. For a start, these air bubbles in the concrete act like a giant sponge sucking in moisture, and that moisture corrodes the reinforcement. Now, corrosion in concrete is cancer. We can't see it, and we can't really test for it. The only way we can discover it is if it shows itself on the outside of a structure. In things like a car park, this tends to become obvious quickly because there are no finishes to a car park. If you look up, generally you'll see the raw surface of the concrete, but in a building we have finishes, we have suspended ceilings, things that hide the raw structure and make identifying a reinforced concrete structure which is corroding much more difficult. And even if we can identify the problem, it is almost impossible to fix. There is no practical way to remove a corroded piece of rebar and replace it. We would need to destroy the concrete to do so. So even if we can identify the corrosion, the only realistic way of dealing with the problem is to remediate. And for remediate, read delay. Prevent any further moisture from finding its way into the slab and hope that the problem goes away. In practical terms, once corrosion can be seen on the outside of a reinforced concrete structure, an invisible stopwatch begins. That structure will need regular monitoring and maintenance 
and one day the people carrying out that work will turn around and say the problem is terminal. There is nothing more that can be done. The building needs to come down. This is a concrete structure in my town. It's a car park. If I zoom in, you can clearly see the concrete coming apart along the edges. This is because the reinforcement buried in the slab has rusted and is now slowly pushing the concrete outwards. I've been keeping my eye on this car park for some time. The problem is not going away. It is getting worse in my opinion. The quantity of cars that are allowed to park has been halved. It is only one car per bay now instead of the original two. But most of the loading on a concrete structure is in itself weight. So this remediation has probably only reduced the load on the structure by about 10%. It is better than nothing, I suppose. The stopwatch on this car park started ticking quite some time ago. Back to RAAC, the problem of moisture penetration is compounded because most, if not all, of these reinforced, aerated, autoclave concrete slabs are used for flat roofs, i.e. the kind of surface which is difficult to drain and is notorious for water problems. The guidance, well, the guidance before all of these recent issues was a program of remediation. So look for problems, investigate, thoroughly waterproof, and then maintain that waterproofing. But fundamentally, that is not an easy thing to do when your roof is essentially a sponge and it is orientated in such a way that it increases the likelihoods of that sponge sucking up water. There is a fundamental problem here. The issue has been remediated long enough. The stopwatch started ticking some time ago and now it is the time for the reckoning. In simplistic terms, that is where we are. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna briefly go off script here. So there's a, there's a, there is a, a common problem in engineering in that we tell our high, the higher powers, the people making the decisions that they're making a bad decision. Um, you know, and we explain it and we lay it out. We do drawings and studies and we, we, and then the people making the decision, they just say, oh, no, 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 we know better than you. And, you know, as engineers, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and move on. We go, are you sure? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just kind of move on because we know we have no power. We can only, we, we are consultants at the end of the day. We, we, we provide our best opinion based on our best experience, our best advice. And, and then it gets ignored and then we end up in situations like this. You know, it, seriously, what, what do we expect? I mean, oh, I need to go back to the script. The next barrage of problems comes down to the age of the structure and probably more specifically, the time in which it was constructed. Structures built in the 70s and 80s are problematic and not just the concrete ones. I do a lot of work nowadays on residential domestic structures and whenever I'm working on a building which was constructed in the 70s and 80s, there are always, how do I say this, surprises. There was a lot of experimentation back then and this included how buildings were put together. This is UK specific experience by the way, it is probably completely different everywhere else but we are talking specifically of UK schools getting closed. so this is relevant. There were new and different building techniques, non-standard construction methods, varying quality in design and in choice of materials. If I ever find myself working on a 70s or 80s building, then for each and every one I am starting from scratch. Each one is different from the last and they are all vastly different from anything else from any other time frame. If a new thing for the time was being tried out, like these RAAC planks, for example, then there is almost zero information available to me. I don't know how strong they are. I don't know what they are made of. I don't know how much reinforcement is in them. I know nothing. You might be familiar with the idea of proprietary technology in that technology that is almost designed specifically to keep outsiders from looking at it and asking questions. For every 70s and 80s building I look at, there is some proprietary technology being used that I've not seen before and any information about it is long since lost. This is the problem of 70s and 80s construction in a nutshell. Now, to be specific about RAAC though, 
These are exactly the sorts of issues we as engineers face. There are no load span tables available, no typical cross sections. For all intents and purposes, each RAAC plank is different from the last. It's a black box. I have been able to find some stuff though. This is what I've been able to find. Image one is from a report by the Institution of Structural Engineers called Reinforced Auto... Blah, 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 you can read it on the screen. If we scroll down, then we find this image depicting the typical arrangement of reinforcement in one of these RAAC panels. And, you know, this doesn't actually seem unreasonable. The plank is 600 millimeters wide, so we have four bars in the bottom for tension in red and two bars in the top for anti-crack and possibly some compression in blue, linked with transverse bars that run perpendicular. These transverse bars would seem to be positioned unevenly across the length of the plank, which is fine from a structural perspective. We want them where the shear is highest, which is at the supports. But it is curious from a manufacturing perspective. This arrangement would seem to suggest that each plank was custom made for each project in mind. Let's just say the company manufacturing these planks was churning these things out in bulk. They would want these transverse ribs to be evenly spaced so that the planks could be cut up willy-nilly and there would still be ribs in the right place. You would want the ribs throughout the plank to allow maximum flexibility for the purposes of what it could be used for. Now, I mean, this, this could just be a diagrammatic sketch though, and intended purely to indicate a typical array of reinforcement. There are probably many variants of these slabs. This might just be one of those variants, or an average. Who knows? Image 2 is taken from the International Construction website, link in the description below. Now, I'm just guessing here because we don't have the full image, but we have a bar in the top here, which I would assume is the middle of the plank. Then I think this is a bar in the top left here. And in the bottom of the plank, we have three bars, two of which line up roughly with those in the top and one in the middle of those two. Now, all of these assumptions being correct, this slab has five bars in the bottom and three in the top, which is different from what was shown in the last image and kind of makes my point. The thing that is interesting about this image is that I think we can start understanding the fundamental dimensions of the thing. Now, for my money, these look like 10 millimeter bars. That isn't just based on looks. 10 millimeter bars are the smallest bar we use on a construction site for anything serious. It makes sense that that is what they probably are. 10 mil bars are generally our starting point for all reinforcement and then we kind of get bigger from there. So if they are 10 mil bars, then the slab is probably 150 millimeters thick. And that makes sense also. These planks are probably going to be resting, being supported by a masonry structure and they therefore need to be dimensioned in a manner which is compatible with a brick and or a block. So 10 mil bars, 150 millimeters deep, 600 millimeters wide, and we are probably looking at a 400 millimeter wide section of it. A couple of interesting things to note. One, we can clearly see the aerated nature of the type of concrete we are dealing with. If I bring up an image of a typical section of concrete, the makeup and composition is vastly different. The RAAC really is like a big sponge. The other thing to note would be the positioning of the bottom rebar itself, which seems not to be level. The, the bar on the left looks further away from the edge of the slab than the one in the middle. This would suggest to me poor quality during manufacture. You generally want those bars to be exactly where you want them to be. If they are out of place, then that is not optimal for strength or for longevity. For our purposes, which bar is in the right place? Was the intention for the middle bars to be slightly higher or for the edge ones to be slightly lower? We need to talk about concrete cover. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm delving too quickly into topics which are probably completely new to you. You know, concrete is a really big subject when things start to go wrong and there is a certain amount of required background technical gumph that I need to go through in order to cover these subjects adequately. Okay, so the thing that prevents water from getting to the reinforcement and rusting is the concrete cover. This is the amount of concrete that separates the reinforcing bar from the edge of the slab. 
for our RAAC slab, these are the concrete covers for the bottom bars. Depending on the environment that the concrete slab is exposed to, the concrete cover will vary. So in a highly aggressive environment, and this isn't necessarily limited to just water here either, we would have more cover than one which is, was in a less aggressive environment. A floor, for example, would need less concrete cover than a roof would, because the roof would be expected to be exposed to rain. The amount of concrete cover that is given to the reinforcement at a very basic level, if compared over many decades of the use of concrete and its development, and for a defined specific application, will indicate to me how much life that piece of concrete would have from its moment of construction. If, for example, the standards of today tell me that I need 50 millimeters of cover, so two inches, for a particular location, and there is only 30 millimeters, 1.2 inches if that means anything, in the slab constructed in the 70s or 80s, then I know we are in trouble. 50 years has been able to pass without the reinforcement having the required protection. That 20 millimeters might not seem like much, but it is the difference between a building lasting 30 years and one lasting 50 years or more. If we look at the bottom reinforcement to the RAAC slab in question, I would say we are looking at 20 millimeters of cover to the bar in the middle and 30 millimeters of cover to the bar at the edge. Cover to the top is really difficult to say. This plank looks like it's been tested to destruction or, or maybe it was just sliced up poorly. Regardless, the top edge isn't easy to identify. If it is the flat edge that we can see, then that looks like about 10 millimeters cover, which would be really bad, really bad. The top surface is the one exposed to the rain. This is where the cover is needed. It makes no sense to have more cover to the bottom reinforcement. For this environment, I would want a minimum of 30 mil, potentially even 40. So if it's only 10, then that is completely inadequate. And this is before we even get to the fact that these dimensions for concrete cover that I'm referring to are for normal, modern concrete with aggregate, not aerated, autoclaved stuff. For my money, with a porous concrete such as this, you are probably going to need significantly more concrete cover than would be necessary for your traditional stuff. You might even say that reinforced, aerated, autoclave concrete would need so much cover to protect it from the intrusion of the outside elements that it almost wouldn't make any sense to use it in the first place. And you know, that's, it, it's funny how we don't use it anymore, eh? From here, if you are still with me, we begin on the thorny road of sticky subjects. <laughs> I, I'm an engineer, so I try to be as objective as much as possible. I want tested facts or failing that a thorough understanding that has been gained over many many years of experience and what I'm about to talk about is none of that. These are unproven big picture theories. They are not completely unfounded but they are also rooted solely in my own education and my career experience. Big picture problem number one. How long should a building realistically last? This is a difficult question to answer because the answer to it can't be forever. No building will last forever. If you leave a building in the middle of a field and don't maintain it, then one day it will be unusable regardless of what you build it out of. But equally, if we look around, and I'm talking UK specifically here, then we can see buildings that are 100 years old that are still standing. There are some that are many hundreds of years old and still standing. We could even look at buildings constructed in the 50s, in the aftermath of the war when everything was tight. Materials, money, you name it. Just 20 years before the time period we are discussing, and even those buildings are lasting better than the buildings built in the 70s and 80s. So, what's going on? How long should a building last? The problem for me was the moment someone asked this question. Because the moment you ask this question, then the ultimate conclusion is, who is responsible? If a building doesn't last for its intended lifespan, who is at fault? Realistically, nobody can be blamed for designing a structure in a particular manner some 50 years ago. So, in my opinion, back then, 
there was an incentive to make a building last exactly as long as its intended lifespan and not a day more. Think of the warranty on your washing machine, but for buildings. And the intended lifespan of buildings that have been constructed since we started asking that question? 30 to 50 years. The, the lifespan of buildings constructed before that question was even conceived? With the right maintenance, those ones will last forever. And those ones weren't intended to last any particular length of time. There was no design on that respect. They were simply built to last. And that, in my opinion, is what is happening here. Instead of spending a bit more time, effort and money constructing a building that could have theoretically lasted forever with the right maintenance, we instead built a building that only needed to last as long as they intended it to. And no more than that. <laughs> Ultimately, we are now in a position where every 30 to 50 years, we need to replace all the structures that were built 30 to 50 years ago, forever, ad infinitum. Most structures built before that will be fine and dandy for quite some time, provided they are looked after. Oh, this is my opinion. Um, and if you're looking around the UK and seeing this kind of problem in other areas, I'm, I'm thinking of the sewage, the sewage issues here specifically, then this is, in my opinion, why. If it was built in the 70s and 80s, then there's going to be issues. I've had this picture up for a bit. This is the primary school I went to 30 years ago. It was constructed in 1900, still standing, completely unchanged from the way I remember it. And look at the roof. It is sloped and made of timber. Now, timber reacts to water worse than concrete, but with the simple addition of a slope and some tiles, it will naturally expel water and prevent it from penetrating through. These roofs might look elaborate and over the top, but at a very basic level, they are designed solely to expel water and they are good at it. So they last, and this one has. It might not be the most thermally efficient or practical of buildings, but it is still, at least, fulfilling its ultimate purpose, which is to teach children. Which is, which is really all that matters when it comes to a school. I mentioned it earlier, and it is what I'm going to use to close this video up. In the years leading up to the credit crunch, there was a huge program of school renovation labelled Building Schools for the Future, or BSF. New schools were being built on their playing fields, and then once completed, the old school was demolished. That, and this is how I found myself in the position of designing those two schools I mentioned earlier. It was a big program, and a lot of schools were updated in this way, but when the credit crunch came, it was immediately shut down and never brought back. There was a game of musical chairs, and if you were one of the lucky ones, you got a brand new school, and if you weren't, then tough diddums. That's, that's just how it was. I guess, in conclusion, I would say the following. These RAAC planks have been a problem for some time, and the right people have known about it. The issue was being investigated, and monitored, and remediated, and in the early 2000s, the right decisions were being made and the problem was being rectified. Then the money got whipped away and the problem stopped getting solved. The problem started getting worse. 15 years later, here we are. I'll leave any further conclusions for you to draw by yourself.